Hustler Rod. Hustler Rod. There's a little switch on the side there. Turn the switch on. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming again. Sorry for the delays in the morning. So, uh, our next speaker is Rod Coleman, and he uh, founded, co-founded an interesting computer company in the uh, early 80s called Sage Computer. And um, they had what at one point was the fastest microcomputers in the world. And so Rod's going to tell you the interesting story about the company, the computer, and the aftermath. Here's Rod Coleman. Thank you very much. Okay, um, curious, uh, is it is the idea of making this presentation was fairly recent for me, and uh, I didn't realize it was the kind of interest in the archaeology of computers that seems to exist. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm curious in the audience, how many people have actually worked with the Sage computer? That's <laughs> <laughs> uh, good. Okay, uh, I'm going to take you back um, about 25 years when uh, computers were very different in the world. And uh, to do it, I'm going to use a blog post here. This is my blog, it's called Sudden Disruption, which is actually my client name. Uh, there are a lot of other topics on this blog as well as we'll see the index. But uh, I started writing this uh, a couple weeks ago. Well, I actually part of it a long time ago, but uh, finished it here in the last few days. This is essentially this, the history of Sage Computer. So if there's something I don't cover, you can go to this blog, and it's probably in there. It's fairly comprehensive. Uh, everything I'm going to talk about today is in there, certainly, and, uh, and a lot more. Yeah. So I'm just going to be flipping down to this blog post and picking up the points. Um, in general, for me, Sage Computer is about the technology and the people and, and our customers and what we did. And uh, to introduce that process, we to introduce some people. Uh, and it looks like we've lost the... Uh, Slow connection? <laughs> no, it's, I think the font got changed. Um, and I don't know how to change it, so we're just going to go ahead without it. Um, two people of very early involvement with me in terms of computers and electronics were Lonnie Klein and Dave Klein, my first cousins. I grew up in Northern California, and uh, computers and electronics were a long ways away. It's the lumber industry, it's what my family was involved in, but I enjoyed uh, learning about electronics, and so I got started very early with my cousins. Uh, in high school, I uh, discovered uh, logic. And Scientific American had an uh, actual diagram for how to build an ALU. And so I got transistors together and designed my first ALU, which is functional. Um, my first computer, essentially, of sorts. I continue to work in the industry. Um, I'm not sure if we're going to get any of these other headings up here. Um, Got involved with an HP 2000B online terminal. It actually was hooked up to a computer in Berkeley. And that's where I learned basic. Uh, I was doing this at college. And in the, in the process, we only had one terminal in the entire college, one TTY. And so uh, we had to take turns, timeshare the timeshare terminal. And I ran into a guy there, Bob Vita. And we quickly became friends. We both uh, essentially learned basic on that TTY. And, uh, a lot of software. I used to do my chem labs and do reverse simulations of my chem labs and come up with chem data so I didn't have to go do all the webinar. And, uh, it, was, uh, it was another way to use computers and understand the whole process. And, uh, so I had a lot of fun with it. And I especially enjoyed, you know, the HP equipment. It was very impressive to have a real hands-on computer experience. So that was my, my first real connection with it. Shortly after that, I kind of was seduced out of the business world, had an opportunity to work on IBM System 3 Model 8, and uh, learned RPG, and accounting, inventory control, a lot of the other boring things that computers do, but uh, also get a, a good understanding of business in the process. Uh, along the way, uh, I found the, uh, well, the number of things, 
heard. One of them was the introduction of the Altair, popular electronics magazine. And um, I think some of you may have seen the cover from January of 1975. And of course, I uh, got a copy of it. I think Dave Klein brought it to my office one day, and we were looking at it, trying to figure out, well, what can you do with it? I think it had 256 bytes of RAM. So the answer was, well, not much. Uh, the toggle switch and the lights were cool. And, uh, but I, I held off, I didn't buy one. Uh, and about that time, I got an offer um, to work in Reno, Nevada. So I moved from Northern California to Reno. Uh, and it was a chance to uh, go to work for a company called Lynch Communications. They were uh, implementing the Intel 8008 at the time. And it was my first coding, assembly coding of a microprocessor. Had a lot of fun with it and met a guy named Bill Bonham, who ended up being one of the founders of this company as well. Uh, Bob Needham, Bill Bonham, and I are essentially the founders. We were the founders of Sage Computer. So that's how that happened. Uh, also met another guy named Paul Lima, who was my boss at the time. Um, Paul had studied at MIT and then later went to work at Bell Labs. And very impressive uh, guy in terms of hardware design. I learned a lot from him as, uh, as we went along. I was with uh, Lynch Communications for about four years and uh, doing, doing design work, mostly in software, system software and design. In the process, uh, we bought serial number three and serial number four of Shugart's first hard drive, hard disk drive, Alan Shugart's first company, which was called Shugart, later bought by Xerox, some of you people may know that history. Um, and uh, one of my jobs was to implement that system. So. I got to know hard disks, uh, hard disk controllers. You want me to fix the font or something? Yeah, it would help uh, get the uh, titles up. I'll know where I am. Um, don't have to remember. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so I uh, developed a lot of experience with that. Also, the Z80. Uh, spent a lot of time with Z80. I used to be able to do machine code Z80 from memory. Uh, instead of bothering with the assembler, I just uh, plugged in the hex. And, uh, I did a lot of a lot of the hard coding. Okay, and uh, okay. One of the other things I discovered at Lynch Communication was the P system. The university, a group in the University of California, San Diego, had taken uh, Niklaus Wirth's original work from ETH in Zurich and had implemented uh, what later became popularly known as Apple Pascal. The Pascal compiler, more importantly, it was an entire operating system environment, and specifically it had a great screen editor, which was the first thing I fell in love with. And uh, then I also learned a lot of the advantages of Pascal's structured programming. I was very impressed with that technology in general. And uh, we worked with it extensively at Lynch. As a matter of fact, I believe Lynch was probably the, uh, the first installation of the P-System outside the university. That became a, a, a central factor, as you'll see as we move along here. And uh, get to the, the why of Sage Computer. <coughs> the why of Sage Computer primarily, um, well, two major factors. One, I wanted one, okay? <laughs> Which is the genesis for a lot of ideas and products. Uh, and number two, the, the second reason was IBM didn't do it. Now, if you're familiar with Sage, you're familiar with the 68,000 architecture from Motorola. I first heard the rumors of this in 1978, and I was very impressed with the idea that it had 32-bit registers. Uh, to me, that was going to be the answer in terms of being able to address lots of content, and more specifically, large objects. Uh, I, I felt the limitations of 64K byte were utterly unreasonable, even though at the time, nobody could afford 64 4K bytes of memory, I, you know, I saw that that was going to be a significant limitation uh, as Moore's Law came into the process. And yeah, we knew about it back then. It was discussed and everybody figured, well, it'll, it'll, it'll cruise along for three or four or five years maybe, but uh, you know, at least we're going to get past this 16-bit limitation at some point. And I felt the sooner we start writing 32-bit software, the quicker we're going to uh, really get into some interesting applications. So uh, I saw the need, uh, if you will, a need for me, and I thought, well, uh, 68,000 was roughly based on the IBM 370. Uh, Motorola has admitted this, and, um, and if you look at it, there are a lot of similarities. 